Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer, and this is a Superhouse special episode. Previously on Superhouse, I've shown you how I hooked up an RFID reader to the door of my home office so that I could walk up to the door and scan a tag, either something attached to a keyring or the tag that is surgically implanted in my arm. I deliberately didn't go into the details of implantation technology because some people are a bit squeamish about that. I wanted to separate it off and have an episode just about implantable RFID. And that's what this is. So later on I'm actually going to show you the video. It's very poor quality. It was done seven years ago on a cheap camera. But the video of the implantation when I put the RFID chip in my arm. And there's blood and everything. So if you're feeling squeamish, don't watch that. Don't worry though, I'll put that right at the end of the episode and I'll warn you so you can watch the rest of this episode and not have to see that if you don't want to. Now the thing is that when I do this project there were really three objectives that I had in mind. And the first objective was to understand the technology. I've already explained a little bit about how RFID works in a previous episode and I really wanted to be hands on with it. I wanted to know how uh, how it interacted in terms of the communications protocols, um, what capabilities are available in different tags, what range you could get from different types of tags. So part of it was investigating all of that. Now the second reason was regulatory. I wanted to understand what it would take to implant something in my body that was not done for medical reasons. It's not that straightforward. Now, I could have gone to something like a tattoo parlor or you know, a body piercing shop and said, I want to insert this in myself, and they would have done it, no questions asked. But what I really wanted to know was how hard is it to do this through the proper channels? So I went to see my GP, and I took with, it, with me all the research. I had printouts of data sheets for implantable RFID tags, information about their use in pets, and ideas for how I wanted to use it to open doors and things. And I showed all of this to my GP and I was worried that he was going to think I was a nutcase and throw me out. And he sat and looked at all of this for a little while, talked to me about it, asked some questions, and then he was silent for a minute. And then he said, this is really interesting. I would like to see how this works. And it turned out that he actually wanted to help me do it. The thing is that he was not a surgeon, he was a GP. So he referred me to a couple of other surgeons, uh, people that he knew. One was a hand surgeon, the other one was a plastic surgeon. I went and saw both of them. And once again, they were both really interested in the project. And in the end, I had a, um, an appointment with the hand surgeon and he had agreed to do the procedure. So he was going to implant the RFID tag in my arm because we discussed possible implant locations. And it was all set to go ahead. Now the thing is that uh, on the morning of the procedure, I got a phone call from the surgeon saying, look, I'm really sorry, I want to do this, but I phoned my medical insurance company and they laughed at me. So um, that couldn't go ahead. The end result is a bit of a funny catch-22 situation. Now, there, the thing is that medical insurance covers specific approved processes or procedures and implanting an RFID tag into a person is not an approved procedure. So there is a way around this to some extent. And this is where a bit of the comedy of errors comes in. Now the thing is that it is possible in Australia to have special exemption for a medical device to be implanted if it is also approved by the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration in Australia, our equivalent Oh, in the US. Our equivalent in Australia is what's called the TGA, which is a Therapeutic Goods Administration. So if there is a device that is approved by the FDA in the US, it is possible for a doctor to sign a piece of paper that says, yes, this patient needs this particular device. And they can do it, even if it hasn't yet been approved by the TGA. It's like a cross-licensing sort of scheme, a cross-approval scheme. So the doctor discovered that he could do this for implantable RFID tags, but there is a problem. This is where the catch comes in. The tags that are approved for use in the US 
operate at 125 kilohertz. Now, the US typically ha um, uses 125 kilohertz for implantable tags because that's what historically was used way back in the days before international standards for this sort of stuff. And the international standard specifies that it must be 134.2 kilohertz for implantable tags. Now, that means that the appro FDA approved tags do not run at the approved frequency for use in Australia. So, we are in a conundrum. We could get uh, rubber stamp TGA approval for the 125 kilohertz tags, but they would not meet the local spectrum allocation authority uh, regulations. Or we could get 134.2 kilohertz implantable tags, which meet the local spectrum allocation authority regulations, but they do, don't meet the FDA slash TGA standards. So we would have to be in breach of either the Therapeutic Goods Administration or the local communications you know, spectrum standards. We couldn't comply with both at the same time, only one or the other. So the end result was we were kind of stymied by the red tape. It wasn't possible to get it done through proper channels, having a surgeon do it, covered by his medical insurance and everything was fine. Now, it's quite likely that you could find a doctor who would do it for you. Um, they would just agree to do it. But in my case, it didn't work out. So in the end, I just gritted my teeth and did it myself. And that's what I'll talk about in a little bit. But we'll come back to that for those that are squeamish. Now, the third aspect of this is social. The time I did this was in 2007. It was around the time that there were RFID tags being added to Australian passports. In fact, they were being added to passports in quite a few different countries. And there was a lot of public discussion about it because people were saying RFID tags will make our passports insecure because terrorists will be able to walk into an airport and scan everybody's passports and get data from them. And they'll be able to identify different nationalities and then target people by their nationality and things like that. So there was a whole lot of hypothetical stuff going on. And I was wanting to understand whether this was technically possible, which is part of my technical um, investigation into it, and also whether, um, you know, if this would actually be a, a social issue. And whether um, tracking by um, RFID was a big problem in terms of privacy. Now about this time, I went to the US and um, did a presentation at OzCon, which is the open source conference over there run by O'Reilly. And I met a couple of really interesting people, including one uh, from a group called Fobud, which is an anti-RFID group. They gave me a little anti-RFID badge, which I wore around the conference while also having an implanted RFID tag. And the anti-RFID badge, the idea is that it lights up whenever it's put into a near an RFID reader. So if you're walking through a shopping center and there are RFID readers trying to scan you, the badge will light up and it will show you that, hey, someone's trying to scan you. So there was a lot of discussion at the time about implantable RFID and whether that could be used as an invasion of privacy. Could someone be scanned basically by um, an implantable tag and then identified wherever they go? Now, one of the things I discovered is that because the read range on implantable RFID is so low, you really have to have the reader within 10 millimeters or so of the tag. It's very, very hard to actually track anybody using this sort of technology. I and mean, people hypo, um, you know, think about put RFID readers in doors in buildings and then every time someone walks through it, you can see you know, they've gone through this door and you'll know what room they're in or whatever. The fact is with implantable RFID, the range is too short, that's just never going to happen. You have to walk up and put a, a scanner right up against their skin. In fact, one of the problems with implantable RFID for vets is that even when they are specifically holding a reader against the back of the neck of a dog or a cat, trying to read a tag that's implanted, they often can't read it. So it's not unknown for a lost animal to go to something like a pet rescue shelter, uh, be scanned to see if it has an owner, they can't pick up the tag and therefore they re-tag it, they might re-implant it and then sometime later it's discovered this animal's got two tags in it. That sort of thing happens even when a skilled operator is trying to find a tag and they know approximately where it should be. 
So using implantable RFID technology as a way to track people as they move around in the world is just really not practical. However, there is a privacy danger with RFID and that's more with larger tags. Because larger tags can be read from a bigger distance, you can do remote reading. For example, the RFID tags that are used for things like uh, mass transit cards, for building access passes, you're probably carrying at least one or two RFID tags right now. Those can be read at a bigger distance, often from many metres away. So the danger is not so much with implantable RFID, even though I've been called um, you know, someone bringing on the mark of the beast in various forums I've seen around the place. Um, the danger is not so much the implantable technology because that's just so limited. It's more in the cards that you carry with you, either in your clothing or in your wallet or wherever it might be. So let's have a look at some of the implantable technology and I'll show you the equipment that I used to implant the tag in myself. At the top you can see an integrated RFID reader. This is a commercial unit from Priority One Designs and I found them to be really reliable. I've already connected up a little breakout connector on this and you can see it's got a pin header on it so I can just plug it straight into an Arduino and read values from it. In the middle, the little black thing that's like a big grain of rice, that is the implantable RFID tag. It's 12.2 millimeters long and about 2.2 millimeters diameter. It's coated in a material called Paralene, which is slightly porous. The actual material of the tag itself is called soda glass. It's a type of glass that is inert, so it doesn't react with your body and it's safe to be implanted and you don't get any rejection or reaction problems. The reason it's coated with Paralene is that without a coating, the glass itself is very smooth and the tag can migrate around inside your body and that's really not a good thing. Paralene forms a, um, a bond with proteins that are in the body around it. So what happens is that protein strands grow into the pores in the paralene and they lock it in place. So once the tag has been implanted, uh, once it's been in there a day or two, it's locked in place and then it won't move. Uh, down at the bottom you can see the RFID implanter and basically it's just a really big syringe. The RFID chip is loaded into the front of the syringe um, that is then inserted under the skin and you depress the plunger to push the chip out. Um, you then withdraw the implanter and the chip stays behind. Well, that's the idea. Didn't quite work out that way for me and you'll see that in just a second. So it's finally time for the footage of the implantation process itself. If you're feeling queasy, now is the time to turn off because there is about to be some blood. Now I'm really sorry that this footage is so poor, but this was done on a digital camera seven years ago in very low light. It was just in a room with a regular overhead bowl. And um, so the first thing I did was shave back the part of my arm where I was going to do this. Now it's very important with all of this to keep everything sterile. Because the chip is implanted right under your skin, it's into the subcutaneous um, fat layer, it absolutely has to be sterile. Now the chip and the implanter that I purchased were pre-sterilized. They come that way from the factory, so you just rip it open and it's ready to go. What you can see here is me using a medical uh, antiseptic swab to clean off the skin from my arm because I wanted to make sure that everything was totally sterile. And then because I was doing it on my own, I had to pinch the skin up. Um, so I used a piece of sticky tape, wrapped it around my arm, and um, I did this once my skin was bunched up so that when pressure was applied, it would hold the skin in place. Of course, this would be far easier if you were doing it on someone else or having someone else do it to you. But I was doing this on my own with no anesthetic or any painkillers or anything else. So I put the implanter up against my skin and pushed. Now I'm going to pause it here because there's a very interesting effect. What you can see is I was pushing quite hard. You can see it's distorting the skin. This implanter is very, very sharp. And I discovered an interesting fact about my brain, which is that I don't want to hurt myself. It was very interesting that when I had the implanter against my skin, I was pushing against it and my own inhibitions against self-harm were kicking in and I thought that I was pushing hard but I actually was not applying enough force to break the skin. So at this point I had to men mentally disengage myself from the process and it was as if 
that wasn't really my arm there, it was just something on the table and I could apply as much force as re was required. So I then um, basically disengaged my brain and just pushed in the implanter. Uh, but it was a very interesting lesson in how strongly our brains um, work to prevent us from harming ourselves. So then with a bit of force I managed to get it inside and that was where the um, tag failed to stay in. So I pushed in the plunger and you can see the tag was still attached to the end and I had to manually push it in with my finger. So that was shoving the tag back inside and making sure that it was fully inside the, um, the hole in my skin. And then a bit more disinfectant there to make sure that um, uh, it was all clean on the outside. So then I just removed the tape and um, after I removed the tape it all started bleeding because I had a fairly large hole going right through my skin um, into the, uh, the fat layer below and you can see the blood there just keeps coming out but it didn't take all that long um, I just kept wiping it off with antiseptic um, put a band-aid on it let it heal up and it was okay so here, at this point I had the chip under the skin and um, it was ready to test. Of course I'd already tested it before implanting it to make sure I wasn't implanting a dud chip. So I found my implanted RFID tag to actually be really useful. It's very handy to be able to walk up to a door and not have any keys, not have to worry about where things are. You just put your arm in the right place, door unlocks and you're in. It's fantastic. But you don't have to go the implant route. As I've shown previously you can use different format RFID tags. So you can achieve really cool things with a tag attached to a bracelet or a watch band or um, just in your wallet, something you carry around. So RFID is a really interesting technology. It's fun to play with, so check it out. See ya!